Okay, welcome everyone. Um, for today's kind of seminar, we're very happy to have Ilya Esterlis joining us from uh, Harvard. Ilya is uh, an expert on the electron phonon problem, among many other things. Um, but today he'll tell us about electrons coupled to different uh, bosons and uh, about a very interesting tractable model of a uh, non Fermi liquid. Um, so, Ilya, take it away. Cool. Well, thanks, Luca. And thank you guys uh, very much for having me. It's really a, it's a pleasure and it's nice to see so many familiar faces, uh, albeit virtually. Um, so, yeah, hopefully you know, we can get see each other in, in person soon, soon enough. Um, so today I'll be telling you about uh, some work on large N, on a large N theory of, of critical Fermi surfaces. Uh, and this is work in collaboration with Hao Yu Guo, Avishkar Patel, and Subir Sachdev. Uh, Hao Yu is a grad student uh, at Harvard with Subir, and Avishkar is a postdoc uh, now, at, now at Berkeley. Um, and this work is based on this uh, archive preprint here. Okay. Oops. There we go. So today we'll be discussing uh, what happens near quantum critical points. So I thought I'd start by sketching a sort of prototypical phase diagram for such a problem. Uh, so here I'm imagining a system in which some tuning parameter called here R can drive the system through a zero temperature quantum phase transition uh, such that for small R, the system is in a symmetry broken state in which the order parameter phi has a non-zero expectation value. And upon increasing R, the symmetry is, is restored. Of course, the symmetry can also be restored uh, by a thermal melting at finite temperature. And so what, what makes these sort of quantum critical points uh, interesting is that their influence is not kind of limited to the immediate vicinity of the point itself, but can rather extend over a broad regime of the phase diagram shown by this kind of shaded area here known as the quantum critical fan, uh, so that the kind of long wavelength behavior of the system is strongly affected uh, by the existence of this QCP over a broad regime of, of parameters. And so the question I'd like to address today is what happens when we take this quantum critical point and couple it to a metal, which is kind of represented in a cartoon way here by its 2D Fermi surface. So the idea is we, we take the soft fluctuations of the order parameter in the vicinity of this QCP and allow them to interact with the large number of low energy gapless excitations near the Fermi surface that characterize a metallic system. Okay, so your first guess as to what happens, at least if you're familiar with Landau Fermi liquid theory is, is that nothing happens. And the reason is that Landau taught us that uh, systems of interacting fermions are in fact surprisingly stable uh, despite having a large number of gapless modes. Uh, and the reason is, is the following. So if we consider a weakly excited state of a Fermi system, uh, which corresponds to the addition of a particle just above the Fermi C, here shown with momentum K uh, and energy E, then in the presence of interactions, we expect that this excitation will eventually decay. And to conserve energy and momentum, it'll create a particle hole pair in the process. But it turns out uh, that the Pauli exclusion principle greatly kind of limits uh, the phase space for such a process. And in particular, one finds that the inverse lifetime or the decay rate uh, for this excitation scales as E minus EF squared the distance from the Fermi surface squared times the square of the interaction strength V. And so in particular, this, this lifetime uh, tends to infinity as the quasi-particle tends to the Fermi surface so that it becomes more and more sharply defined. And this, you know, for example, is why many properties of interacting Fermi systems like, like metals are similar to a free Fermi gas. So for instance, linear and T-specific heat, uh, constant spin susceptibility at low temperatures. Um, However, near a quantum critical point, the story changes. And the reason is that the soft order parameter fluctuations uh, can mediate long range interactions between fermions. And these long range interactions lead to singular interactions in Fourier space so that the interaction potential itself can become a singular function of frequency or, or energy uh, in such a way that it can compensate for this kinematical factor. And this in turn leads to a breakdown of the Fermi liquid theory. And so the question is, what is the nature of this non-Fermi liquid state that results. Okay, and so I think part of what makes this question particularly interesting is that uh, it's not purely academic, there are kind of real world experimental motivations for it. So there's in fact a host of interesting materials for which the existence of a quantum critical point appears to play an important role in the physics. So for instance, the iron nictides, uh, the heavy fermions, the high TC cuprates, so here I show just two kind of example phase diagrams. On the left here is a phase diagram of an iron-based superconductor. Uh, the, the horizontal axis, which is the tuning parameter that tunes through the QCP is doping, substitution of phosphorus for arsenic in the system. Uh, 
And here is a phase diagram for, an iron, uh, for a heavy fermion compound, where here the tuning parameter is magnetic field. And what you see in common between these phase diagrams is this fan that emerges above the QCP, where some behavior of the system becomes kind of anomalous. So here, for example, they use the uh, behavior, the temperature dependence of the resistivity. So the color scale in both of these plots shows this exponent alpha, which describes how the resistivity of the system tends to its t equals zero value. And so in a Fermi liquid, one expects alpha equals two due to electron-electron scattering. And indeed, away from this fan in these blue regions here, purple regions here, you indeed find this exponent is close to two. Whereas in this fan above the QCP, uh, the scaling is different. In fact, the exponent is, is closer to one. And this is the kind of well-known strange metal uh, regime arising in these sorts of systems. And so I think this connection with real world materials is kind of what part of what makes this problem particularly intriguing. Okay, so now uh, with that in mind, let me describe for you the sorts of um, models that we'll be considering to address this problem. So first we'll restrict ourselves to, to two spatial dimensions. Uh, the reason is that in 1D there's no Fermi surface, just Fermi points. Uh, and so the just, you know, this, behavior is kind of qualitatively different. And here there's other techniques, for instance, bosonization that one can use uh, to study, uh, study the system. And the other possibility is of course three plus one D, but here it turns out interactions are marginal. And so to the extent that they do anything, uh, you won't see their effects until you reach kind of exponentially low energy scales. And so we'll confine ourselves to 2D. And in fact, it turns out that many of the materials for which this question of metallic quantum criticality uh, is potentially relevant are themselves quasi two-dimensional in some way. Okay, so the next uh, important kind of qualifier is that we'll consider Q equals zero order parameters, that is uniform order parameters. So this is in contrast with order that happens at a finite wave vector, such as charge density waves, CDW, or spin density waves, SDW, which break an underlying translation symmetry. Um, and these sorts of finite Q transitions are different because of the presence of so-called hotspots, which are special points on the Fermi surface that can be connected by this ordering wave vector where you can resonantly excite quasi-particles. So in, in, that's you know, um, in contrast to Q equals zero where the whole Fermi surface becomes kind of active and participates. And so here uh, are just kind of cartoons of these two cases. Um, so on the left here, I show the sort of famous example of so-called Ising, of an Ising pneumatic transition. So here in the symmetric phase where phi equals zero, the Fermi surface has a fourfold or 90 degree rotation symmetry. While in the symmetry broken phase, uh, the Fermi surface is distorted along either the X or Y directions, depending on the sign of the order parameter. So here, this Ising order parameter explains why we call it Ising and pneumatic because it breaks the rotation symmetry. And here on the right, um, I show an example or a cartoon of, of these sorts of hotspots where you have two special points on the Fermi surface that can be connected by this ordering wave vector Q for some, some density wave. And so this case on, on the right, we will not be considering here. I'll just be confining uh, my focus to, to uniform order parameters. Okay. So uh, let me now get a little more explicit and write down the model we'll be considering throughout the talk. Uh, so first the fields we're gonna work with are a fermion psi taken to be spinless, here's for simplicity, and the fluctuating order parameter phi. Um, and we'll write the model in terms of a Euclidean action, uh, which is a combination of three terms. And each of these terms I'll write uh, in um, 2D momentum space and imaginary time. So the first term is just the kinetic term for the fermions, epsilon k is the bare fermion dispersion. Uh, the second term is just the Landau. So this is the kind of free term for the bosons and it's nothing but the Landau-Ginzburg-Wilson expansion for the order parameter and powers of the order parameter field itself and gradients. And here C is the speed of the boson and M squared is its bare, bare mass. And most importantly, the last term is the interaction term, which has this yukawa like form, psi dagger psi phi. And here G is the coupling constant and F K of Q is some form factor for the interaction. And that depends on the details of the, the problem at hand. So for instance, in the Ising pneumatic case, the form factor has this structure and so you see that you know, when the order parameter condenses, when phi obtains an expectation value, uh, that'll break the symmetry between X and Y. Uh, but for simplicity and what I'll discuss today, I'll just set this form factor equal to one and forget about it. And this doesn't really change any qualitative conclusions that I'll be, that I'll be drawing. Okay, so now I should uh, pause and say that this sort of model uh, has been really, uh, you know, it's, it's important and it's been 
studied for a long time by many uh, really good good theorists. Um, so on the analytical side, you know, I'm there's there's lots of people, so I apologize to everybody that's not listed here. But you know, Andrei Chubakov, for example, Sung Sik Lee, uh, these, there's people that have made really kind of important uh, steps in understanding this problem. And I should highlight here the work of Sung Sik uh, Lee in particular, uh, because what he showed actually is that kind of um, one way that you might think to attack this problem is by a conventional large n expansion, where you just promote the number of fermions. Uh, to be some large n. And he showed, in fact, that this expansion, in contrast to what you get kind of a relativistic field theory, uh, doesn't work in this problem. It's essentially due to the large number of gapless modes you have on the Fermi surface. And this is a kind of very influential analysis. Um, and so that's on the analytical side. And in, the, in recent years, actually, there's been some really, uh, I think, really important steps taken uh, on the numerical side. Uh, and these were spearheaded by Erez Berg, Oni Schatner, Sam Litter, Ziang Meng and collaborators in which they've done quantum Monte Carlo calculations that have really elucidated, I think, many properties of these metallic quantum critical points, both for this kind of Ising case, as well as uh, the density wave case that I mentioned before. Uh, but despite all this, I think it's still safe to say that we don't have a complete understanding of the low energy behavior uh, of this sort of model. So hopefully the things I'll describe today will, will be um, uh, another route to try to tackle this problem. Okay. So, right, that was the model we want to solve. We can't solve it. So let me now write for you a model we, we think we can solve. Um, and so this will be a particular deformation of this Ising quantum critical point uh, model, and it will be a large end deformation. So firstly, uh, what we'd like to do is write down a model in which we retain the spatial translation invariance. And that was why I wrote everything on the slide in 2D uh, momentum space to kind of emphasize that point. And next, what we'll do is, um, will promote the uh, fermions and the bosons to n flavors. So here j is a flavor index that runs from one to n and the coupling g i j k uh, also obtains this kind of flavor structure and the kind of most, um, I guess, violent <laughs> deformation we'll make is that we'll take these couplings themselves to be random functions of i j and k. Okay, and so, uh, and now the interaction term suppressing kind of all the other dependencies has this structure here. And these GIJKs will take them to be Gaussian distributed with zero mean and a variance given by G squared. And in general, the only constraint on these couplings just follows from unitarity, which says the G star IJK should be equal to GJIK. So if you like, this just says that for each index K of this boson, this GIJ should be a Hermitian matrix. But in general, these can be complex numbers. Uh, and so one way maybe to think about this is as coupled islands of SYK like models. I say SYK-like because there's no four Fermi interactions here, uh, but there have been kind of zero plus one D models like this studied uh, in the last few years, for instance, in these two, uh, in these two references. Okay, so the virtues of this model are that, firstly, it can be solved exactly at n equals infinity. We'll describe uh, that for you. you. Yes, yes. So you say this is a violent modification. Uh, how, how, um, how violent is it really? I mean, is it, uh, you know, if you have an interacting system, is it a very violent thing to do to imagine that the coupling is random instead of just being some fixed number? Um, I mean, I guess, you know, maybe from the standpoint of the original model I wrote on the last slide, I would say it's the most kind of radical departure from that mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, maybe you could try to you know, convince yourself that it's physically not such a crazy thing to do. Like, <laughs> so in, in simpler models, like let's say I take, you know, Wilson Fisher and four minus epsilon or something. Can you do something like this and still get the same answer or does it radically change the IR? Um, so actually that, uh, um, let, me, let me come back to that question in a little okay. bit that I can, I can say something about that. Um, if, if, just don't let me forget, <laughs> but yeah, I think it, but that, that, yeah, that's indeed an interesting question. Uh, okay, cool. So, Good, so yeah, we can solve it exactly at n equals infinity. Uh, and we can also systematically compute the one over n corrections. Okay, so I think that's one uh, really uh, important point here is that we're, we're writing down a controlled theory for, for, these, for this sort of quantum critical point. All right, so uh, let me just now kind of summarize how we, how we attack this problem. Um, and we do it in, in two steps. Um, 
So firstly, one would like to average over these random couplings. Uh, and we do that in a standard way, the so-called replica trick. Uh, in case it's unfamiliar, let me just briefly say what that is. So the idea is the following. So when you average over random couplings, if you were just to average the partition function, it would be easy because these couplings are just Gaussian random variables and we know how to do Gaussian integrals. Uh, but the, the challenge comes from the fact that really what we believe we should do is average over physical observables or correlation functions. And correlation functions are of course obtained as derivatives of the free energy, which is the log of the partition function, and that's harder to average. And so what one does is introduces n little n replicas and writes the logarithm in, in this way. And now z to the power n is easy to disorder, easier to disorder average. And then one just takes the limit and goes to zero at the end. Okay, so this is kind of standard uh, stuff, but let me maybe highlight one uh, less standard aspect of the analysis, which is that after all the manipulations and the dust settles, you want to obtain an action that's in terms of bilocal fields. Bilocal meaning they depend on two space-time co space coordinates as opposed to one. Um, and this is common in these SYK and SYK-like models. If, if you study those, uh, maybe another, actually the only other place where I've really seen or heard of this coming up is in, in disordered systems and nonlinear sigma models uh, for disorder systems where one also obtains this sort of bilocal field and it's interpreted as this so-called diffuse on mode. Um, but okay, so there is some, this is not the first place bilocal fields have appeared. Uh, and next, what we do is we take n to infinity and, and uh, the purpose of that is to make the saddle point equations exact. Okay, and so again, we have four bilocal fields, this G, Sigma, D, and Pi. Oh, and I start, sorry, I should have said on the last slide that we gave them those, uh, we give them those names uh, in a suggestive way because this G ends up being essentially just the fermion Green's function and Sigma is the corresponding self energy in the same way for D and Pi. Uh, and so when we take N to infinity, we get saddle point equations for these, um, for these fields. So the first two of these saddle point equations um, are nothing but the ordinary Dyson equations relating G to sigma and D to pi. So here K is collectively the 2D wave vector and Mat Fermion Matsubara frequency, capital omega is bosonic Matsubara frequency. Um, and the kind of more interesting equations, this third and fourth equations are integral equations for the self energies, uh, which diagrammatically may be a little bit easier to understand. So the first equation is nothing but this rainbow diagram for the fermion self energy. And the second one is the particle hole uh, bubble. And so this is uh, you know, what you would get by just writing down the one loop self energies and replacing everything by the dressed Green's functions as opposed to the bare uh, Green's functions. And so here I should also say that these equations themselves are, are not uh, entirely new. Um, so equations of you know, uh, some, something like this has been around for, for a while. So at least the first instance I'm aware of is in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, Migdal and Ellie Ashberg uh, were writing down equations like this um, in the theory of you know, electron phonon systems. And in that case, they justified this uh, by throwing away vertex. So they threw away vertex corrections, which gives away, which gives equations of this form. And they justified it in those cases uh, because it turns out the vertex corrections are small in proportion to the electron to ion mass ratio, which in a real metal is, is very small. Um, but also in these uh, kind of earlier studies of quantum critical metals, uh, you know, equations like this always pop out in the end in one form or another, maybe with some different bells and whistles, but it's something like this that always comes out. Uh, so, you know, what I'd like to emphasize here is not maybe the equations themselves, but that we've obtained them in a way that you know, is, is the starting point of a systematic large N expansion. Um, okay, good. So let me go on. So let me now uh, summarize uh, the important results at N equals infinity. And here, let me restrict myself to zero temperature and imagine that I tuned the system to the QCP, the quantum critical point. And here it turns out that the low energy behavior can just be obtained analytically. Um, so the kind of first effect, meaning the effect that sets in at the highest energy scale is uh, damping of the bosonic excitations. So here you find that the boson self energy pi obtains this, this has this form mod omega over Q, so the kind of famous Landau damping uh, that comes from decay in, of this bosonic mode into particle hole pairs. And this dominates the bosonic dynamics at an energy scale uh, or below an energy scale that's of order the coupling G. So this, you can just obtain this by comparing the result to the bare bosonic Green's function and asking when does this one win? Um, and in this regime, the bosonic dynamics is overdamped. And 
the dynamic exponent that relates q to omega is z equals three. So here, omega is now a real frequency and the i is to remind us that it's an overdamped mode and it scales as q to the third power. Okay, and now this in turn feeds back onto the fermions. And what you find is that the self energy here evaluated on the Fermi surface has this singular form. It goes as mod omega to the two thirds power. Uh, and now if you similarly just ask, when does this beat the bear Green's function, you find that that happens at an energy scale of order g to the fourth power. So a parametrically lower energy scale, it's smaller at a weaker coupling. Um, and in this regime below this energy scale, the system, the Fermi liquid description breaks down because of this singular contribution to the self energy. Uh, and, and we enter this, this kind of non Fermi liquid uh, regime. Uh, and so just like the equations on the last slide were known, these results are also known. The model omega over Q is well known. This omega to the two thirds is well known for the Ising quantum critical point. But, but again, the, the point that I wanna emphasize is that you know, we obtain them as a, as a starting point of a systematic large N expansion. Okay. So yeah, maybe I can pause for a second and see if there's questions or I'll change gears a little bit here. Yeah, I had a, a question. So, so I guess this is um, this this result shows that uh, averaging does change things a lot, right? Because you avoided the sung sek Lee problem thanks to that. Is it true that the same model without averaging would have infrared problems? Well, so so this the sung sek problem was a problem with the large n a particular large n expansion. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it is true that one expects. Um, I mean, it's, it's a little bit unclear what happens. So it's true that, you know, below this energy scale, the theory becomes strongly coupled and you kind of don't really know what happens unless you have this kind of, uh, you know, this, this controlled expansion, like what we have. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, probably what happens is that in a realistic system is that superconductivity sets in and I'll say more about that later. Mm -hmm. um, but at this stage, I think, yeah, it, we don't, uh, at least as far as the quantum critical properties go, we don't really get anything beyond uh you know what was kind of what, what even what you would get from kind of a one loop perturbation theory uh mm -hmm. to be to be honest but you know that doesn't preclude the possibility that something else is there <laughs> but i'm not sure so if you hadn't averaged you're saying there, there might yeah, be. yeah exactly yeah um yeah okay good but uh, yeah, our hope is that by computing that one over n corrections uh, we'll be able to see some new, new behavior okay good um, so now let me describe for you uh, a, a numerical analysis of these saddle point equations. Um, so you know this what I described for you on the last slide uh, was valid at the critical point in the continuum limit and at zero temperature. Um, and so, but these equations we wrote down are valid kind of everywhere in the phase diagram at finite temperature and away from criticality. Uh, so let me now tell you about how we how we do that with but just by putting the model on a, on, a, on a lattice. Okay, so why why do we do this? Uh, so first of all, um, we can just verify this asymptotic scaling of the of the self energies with an explicit microso microsco microscopic model. So just a nice sanity check. Uh, but I think what's more interesting is that we can, as I mentioned, analyze the behavior away from criticality. Um, and we can also uh, consider the role of thermal fluctuations. And I'll explain uh, in more detail what exactly I mean by that uh, in, in the next few slides. Okay. So yeah, just to be very concrete, we'll just study the model on a 2D square lattice, uh, in which case the fermion, the bare fermion dispersion has this form. This is just for nearest neighbor type binding uh, electrons or fermions. Um, so here T is the hopping matrix element, A is the lattice constant, mu is the chemical potential. And in terms of parameters entering the low energy theory, the Fermi velocity is just the hopping T times the lattice constant A. Uh, and the bare bosonic dynamics is given by this has this form. So you see by expanding for small q, you just get m squared plus c squared q squared, where the boson speed uh, can be identified with square root of j, this, this parameter times the lattice constant. Okay, and now from these microscopic uh, parameters, you can build the dimensionless coupling constant, which I called lambda, which is g squared over j, which has units of energy. And then you normalize it by dividing by the fermion bandwidth w. Um, Okay, and so for the things I'll show you on the next few slides, we'll take this lambda to be 0 0.125, the one eighth, and we'll choose the chemical potential to give this reasonably generic uh, Fermi surface. Uh, 
Um, right. And um, I mean, okay, so yeah, I mean, pause for a second. So, I mean, you could just think of this as a convenient UV regularization and nothing more than that, that's fine. But also, I mean, if you were to try to relate this to kind of more realistic uh, systems, I mean, this is the sort of microscopic starting point you would take anyway, uh, should. So it's not, uh, you know, because it can also be motivated uh, in that way. Um, okay, and let me just also mention one other uh, technical point. Uh, so in the numerics, it turns out um, to make the calculations a little easier, one should add an irrelevant interaction, a u phi to the fourth term, uh, where this is, you know, supplemented with the right indices to be compatible with the large n expansion, uh, and then take u to infinity, which as we know, imposes a fixed length constraint on the boson, which can be written in terms of the bosonic Green's function d in this way. So the local r equals zero and imaginary time equals zero Green's function is some constant that I call one over gamma. Uh, and this, again, this imp uh, imposes a fixed length constraint on the boson. And so this is just another equation that supplements the saddle point equations I wrote a few slides ago. Uh, and we'll take this parameter gamma to be our tuning parameter to access the, the QCP. Okay. So now let me go on to the large n phase diagram. Um, so we obtain this uh, by just solving these saddle point equations uh, with this explicit lattice model. Uh, so much of what you see here is based on the behavior of the renormalized boson mass, capital M squared, uh, which is the bare mass minus the self energy uh, pi at q and omega equals, equals zero. Uh, and we'll also define an exponent x, which tells us how the, bare, how the renormalized mass approaches its t equals zero value. Okay, so here on the left is the phase diagram as a function of this parameter gamma uh, in units of the critical gamma, so that the quantum critical point is at gamma equals gamma over gamma c equals to one, um, and vertical axis is, is temperature. And this right panel shows the boson mass as a function of temperature for various values of gamma. So in the red, uh, the red curves, hope the color is, is clear, uh, corresponds to this Fermi liquid side. Uh, the black curve is exactly at the QCP. And these curves down here are on the ordered side. Okay, so let me start first by what's going on here on the Fermi liquid side. Um, so as you see from these curves, these red curves, the boson mass approaches a finite value as t goes to zero and it approaches it quadratically. So this exponent x has a value two. Uh, and this you can pretty simply understand. So this pi of zero, zero, which is just the particle hole bubble at q and omega equals zero is nothing but the compressibility uh, of the fermions. And we know from the Sommerfeld expansion that the leading temperature correction is T squared over EF squared, Fermi energy squared. Um, okay, and now as we decrease gamma, we tune to the critical point. And in this case, that's this black curve here, we find that the boson mass vanishes essentially linearly as T goes to zero. And there's actually a logarithmic correction, which I guess if you squint hard enough, you can kind of see that happening at the lowest, at the lowest temperatures. Um, and next we can decrease gamma further and go on to the ordered side. Uh, but as you can see from this phase diagram, actually the ordered phase only exists exactly at, at t equals zero. And so also you can see it from the behavior of these, these curves here. So the mass goes to zero as t goes to zero, but it, yeah, but it doesn't vanish at any finite temperature. And in fact, it has this kind of singular form uh, where, yeah, where there's some temperature scale t star uh, below which the boson mass becomes exponentially small. Okay. And this, I would say, actually was the first kind of surprise uh, of, of this numerical calculation. I mean, in hindsight, it's simply because we have an ON model uh, that has, you know, it has an ON symmetry, and in two dimensions, uh, the Merman-Wagner theorem forbids any finite temperature ordering transition, at least as, if, so long as n is bigger than two. Um, but I think if you just were to look at those saddle point equations, that would have not been obvious. It wasn't obvious to me, uh, and so that was the kind of first surprise. Um, okay. Now, the other thing uh, that I want to draw your attention to is that we also see a, a fan, quantum critical fan. So here the color scale is this exponent x that the boson mass is going to zero with, or excuse me, that the boson mass is approaching its t equals zero value with. So here on the Fermi liquid side, the exponent is close to two, which is what one would expect. But here there's a kind of broad regime over which the exponent is, is essentially one. And we obtain this by just taking the log derivative of the mass with respect to temperature. That's what's plotted here. Um, Okay, and now the next uh, kind of last thing that I want to point out on this this slide is is what's going on over here, and this I would say was the second kind of surprise, and that's uh, that there's a regime, you know, where the system does not order uh, 
except strictly at t equals to zero, but where there are strong thermal fluctuations. And I'll explain more clearly what I mean by that as we go forward, but it's kind of a qualitatively different regime, both from this kind of quantum critical fan or what's going on in this quantum critical fan and this Fermi liquid regime. Um, okay, and I'll, I'll kind of uh, elaborate on that in the next few slides. Okay, so to kind of tease out the role of thermal fluctuations, we'll do the following thing. So we're gonna take the fermion self energy and we'll decompose it into two contributions, Q, uh, sigma Q, Q for quantum, sigma T, T for thermal, where the quantum contribution to sigma comes from taking this Schwinger, Schwinger Dyson equation, our saddle point equation, and neglecting those terms in the sum over Matsubara frequency where the uh, external M, or where the summed M prime is equal to the external M. That is, we, we neglect the terms with zero Matsubara frequency transfer uh, and from this boson. That's the quantum part. And then the thermal part just adds it back in. So this is only taking into account the term with at zero Matsubara frequency. So this is just the static contribution uh, from, from this bosonic Green's function. Okay, and so we call it quantum because this kind of contains the time dependent part and T because this contains just the thermal part. Okay, and so we, you know, we're not the first people to make such a decomposition. In fact, this decomposition has been uh, recently uh, very useful for interpreting uh, these numerical quantum Monte Carlo studies of metallic QCPs that I had mentioned. So these two papers just appeared last year um, and they've been very kind of instrumental in helping to interpret the data. Uh, and I should also say that uh, there's uh, these, this set of papers by Taroba and collaborators of PRB and uh, pre archive preprint in which they also try to consider kind of revisit the question of thermal fluctuations and make a similar decomposition. Um, okay, good. Okay, so with that in mind, let me now describe for you uh, the fermion properties throughout the phase diagram. Okay, so now I'm gonna look at the fermion self energy starting first on the Fermi liquid side. Okay, so here I plot, uh, so the red data is the full you know, imaginary part of this fermion self energy. The blue is just the quantum bit and the green, I, I don't know how easy it is to see the colors. I'm sorry if it's unclear, but the green is the uh, thermal bit. So red is this curve, the blue essentially coincides with the red and the green is very small. Um, okay, and the, the self energy of course is in general K dependent. So here what I've done is just averaged over the Fermi surface. Um, okay, and so looking first at the red data, you see that uh, the fermion self energy is essentially linear as a function of Matsubara frequency. Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's, a neg it's negative i times lambda the dimension, it's roughly goes as negative i times lambda the dimensionless coupling times uh, the frequency. And this is, just contributes a mass renormalization to the fermion. Okay. Um, good. And the other thing that's important here is that this thermal bit uh, is very small in comparison to the quantum bit. So that's the data that's down here. Uh, so you see it's always for all frequencies, it's much, it gives a much smaller contribution than the quantum part. Oh, and I should mention one other thing. So here there's a lot of, for each color, there are many data points. Uh, so the different data points correspond to different um, temperatures in this range of inverse temperatures. Uh, and the point here is just that the fact that the data points all kind of fall on one curve means that this object has essentially converged to its zero temperature value so that the different Matsubara frequencies for different temperatures just kind of interpolate that curve. Okay, so that's that's on the Fermi liquid side. Let me now go to the ordered side uh, where there was this funny business of having, there was no finite temperature ordering transition, uh, but I said it was somehow characterized by strong thermal fluctuation. Uh, okay, so here again, I'm doing the same thing. I'm plotting the self energy averaged over the Fermi surface as a function of Matsubara frequency. Uh, this curve shows the full self energy. This one shows the thermal bit, and this one shows the quantum bit. Um, and and let me also say that this is uh, this is detuned very slightly away from the critical point. So you see the gamma is 0.96, so four percent detuning from the critical gamma. Uh, and so one thing to take away from this, about this thermal regime is that it kind of onsets very, very rapidly uh, as you tune away from criticality. And so, yeah, so, so what, what's going on here? So you see that there's a kind of broad, looking at the full self energy, you see there's a broad regime of frequencies over which the self energy is essentially constant. So I called that constant gamma, it's temperature and frequency depend, independent over this regime. 
And then there's an upturn at small frequency and it eventually actually saturates uh, as, you, as you go to lower and lower frequency. And so this is very different, both from a Fermi liquid where the self energy is a decreasing function of decreasing frequency. And uh, similarly, at, at, you know, that's both in the Fermi liquid and in the quantum critical regime. So this kind of behavior, I think is you know, qualitatively different from both of those things. Uh, and, and the other thing is that um, at small frequency, the thermal contribution completely dominates over the quantum contribution. So this is you know, getting very small, this is going up and it also saturates to a finite value. And so this is why we characterize this regime as being as having strong thermal fluctuations. Okay, so now I'm gonna go on to the, the QCP. So I talked about the Fermi liquid side, the ordered side, but maybe I should pause just in case there are questions about these two sides. Uh, okay, I guess not. So now let me go on to properties at the QCP. Uh, so first um, I plot here for you the, the entropy, entropy density as a function of temperature. Um, and so the reason for doing that is, is just because we know from various SYK and SYK like models in, in zero plus one D they have this issue with extensive ground state entropy. So this is just to illustrate that here the entropy is, is well-defined as T goes to zero. Um, and we obtain this entropy by just numerically differentiating the free energy with respect to temperature. So this bottom inset so shows the free energy with respect to temperature. And in our model, of course, the, the free energy is just nothing but the, the action evaluated at the saddle point solution. Easily do this. Uh, and the other inset shows um, kind of a, well, uh, the way it's written, it looks a little funny, but this is, just uh, as a function of you know, uh, wave vector, this is just the fermion spectral function averaged over an energy window of order temperature. So it turns out if you take the fermion spectral function and evaluate it at imaginary time separation beta over two, then this gives the spectral function A averaged over a frequency window of order the temperature. Uh, and the reason for, for doing this as opposed to just getting the full spectral function is just that our calculations were done in imaginary time and Matsubara frequency. And so to get A, you would have to do analytic continuation and that's kind of a pain. So, but this gives you know, a very good proxy. And, and the point here is just that the spectral function is clearly sharply peaked on the Fermi surface. Okay, so we see that there's a well-defined, even at the critical point, there's a well-defined Fermi surface. And this is just the manifestation of Ledger's theorem. Okay, good. So now let me go on to the single fermion properties at the QCP. So let me remind you that the prediction from this uh, low energy theory at t equals zero is that it should have this omega to the two thirds scaling fermion self energy. So the first panel I just show uh, at the lowest Matsubara frequency pi t, the fermion self energy. So the inset shows it as a function of k. Uh, and this is just to illustrate that the self energy is peaked on the Fermi surface. Uh, and this plot shows uh, as a function of angle around the Fermi surface. And you see it varies kind of very mildly and, and smoothly. And it just tracks essentially the non-interacting density of states around the Fermi surface. So this explains why I was taking various Fermi surface averages before because there's no interesting uh, K dependence really. Okay, so the interesting bit is the frequency dependence. So here's the negative imaginary self energy averaged over the Fermi surface as a function of Matsubara frequency for various different temperatures. And it turns out that you can't really fit this to any kind of omega to the two thirds. Uh, this is the full self energy. And so uh, to try to understand what's going on, we again turn to this decomposition in terms of quantum and thermal self energies. So the panel, this left panel shows the quantum contribution, the right panel shows the thermal contribution. And here actually, once you've subtracted out the thermal bit, you indeed find a good uh, agreement with omega to the two thirds scaling. So that's this dashed curve shown here. Um, here there's kind of a stronger temperature dependence to the results, but you can see that it, indeed it appears to be pretty convincingly converging to this omega to the two thirds. Uh, okay, and now the, on the other panel, I show this thermal contribution. Uh, and the first thing to note is that the order of magnitude of both of these contributions is comparable. Uh, and in particular, this thermal contribution has a rather strong frequency dependence, even down to the lowest temperatures. Um, and in fact, it turns out uh, in these studies I had mentioned of, of these these uh, Monte Carlo studies, for instance, in this in this reference, uh, Andrei Chubakov and collaborators had given a prediction for the scaling of this thermal self energy. They said it should behave like this, as temperature divided by frequency. And indeed, this inset just shows a kind of collapse to this scaling form, which we find holds uh, quite nicely for this thermal self energy. Uh, 
And so the lesson here is that to kind of see the quantum critical scaling, it's important to account also for these static uh, thermal fluctuations of the boson. Okay, good. And the last thing I wanna show is just the boson properties. So if you recall, there was this um, Landau damping for the bosons. That was that the self energy goes as mod omega over Q. Uh, and so here is the self energy as a function of this, uh, of, of, of this ratio, omega over Q. Um, for two different cues uh, shown by the two different colors, red and, and blue. Um, and indeed, we find that uh, the frequency dependence is linear, but the slope is not exactly one over Q. It has some anisotropy to it, uh, which is just, you know, which is in fact to be expected because we start, you know, from an anisotropic Fermi surface. So it's not surprising that there's a little bit of anisotropy that remains in this Landau damping. Uh, and here the inset shows the same thing, but just for a larger range of, of wave vectors Q. Uh, but one thing to note here is that uh, this this scaling we do find that it onsets at a much higher temperature uh, than the the anomalous kind of or the the singular scaling not anomalous the singular scaling of the fermion self energy which is to be expected uh, based on these considerations I, I mentioned a while back um, that uh, this kind of Landau damping on, just onsets at a higher energy scale. Uh, okay, so let me now just. Pause. So what, what, what did we learn from all this? So firstly, the low energy scaling at the QCP can be explicitly verified with a microscopic model. So I think that's a good sanity check after taking into account uh, thermal fluctuation effects. Um, we saw that there's no finite temperature transition, at least exactly at n equals infinity. Uh, and there was this surprising thing of a, a kind of a rapid onset of this regime characterized by strong thermal fluctuations in which the boson mass became exponentially small below some temperature scale T star. And the corresponding feedback on, onto the fermions was, was this kind of impurity-like self-energy uh, where the self-energy was essentially just an imaginary constant frequency and temperature independent constant over a broad range of frequency. Okay, so uh, yeah, so now I'm gonna change gears a little bit and discuss the structure of one over N corrections. But maybe again, I can pause and see if there's questions. Um, maybe not. All right. Great. Okay. So yeah, the discussion thus far uh, was just completely uh, restricted to n equals infinity. So now let me just sketch for you uh, the kind of structure of the one over n corrections. Um, and you know, I, I do want to emphasize that the kind of ability to systematically compute these corrections is one of the main, I think, virtues of the approach that we're proposing. Uh, and because it's a little bit technical, I'll be kind of schematic at times here and just give examples as opposed to working in full generality. Um, but I hope at least the structure of, of how this works is, is clear. Okay, so so to- yes, Sorry, can I ask you a question? Sorry, it took me a while to formulate it. Um, this ON symmetry, so are these, are these couplings, so you have these coupling with three indices, are they not Gaussianly sampled? The, so yeah, they, they are. They are. ON symmetric, ON symmetric action for the couplings. They transform as tensors, and that's why this like. Yeah. By so oh. ON invariant. You, uh, you froze a little bit, but I think I understand your question. Yeah. So it turns out to see this ON symmetry, you have to disorder average first, and then the result is something that's ON symmetric. You, are the couplings taken from an on symmetric distribution they're just gaussian no, yeah. yeah they're just yeah so we don't assume any kind of other structure to the coupling so it's yeah it's only after disorder averaging that this on symmetry kind of emerges yes. um, thanks okay good all right so to to describe the structure of the corrections um let me write down now the action which i kind of avoided doing earlier so again the action after uh doing the disorder averaging uh, is written in terms of these bilocal fields g d pi and sigma uh, and it has this form here where g naught and d naught are the non-interacting greens functions for the fermions and bosons respectively uh, and you see here there's uh, you know these two terms where if you expand now for sigma and pi there's an infinite tower of, of interaction terms that's generated this also is an interaction cubic interaction term and these guys are just uh, quadratic in the fields um, okay, and that, yeah, here I'm using a notation, this kind of functional notation where trace of a dot b means means this. Okay, there's an integration over space-time uh, coordinates. Uh, 
And so to set up the, the, the expansion around the, the large end saddle, we'll define two new objects, a curly G, which is this two component greens function, D and G, and this uh, capital C, which is also two component object, which contains pi and sigma, the boson and fermion self energies. And then we'll just take uh, our saddle point solutions, which are denoted by stars, G star and C star, and just expand, okay? And so to quadratic order, uh, we obtain the following thing. So, okay, this is just the quadratic series expansion, but it defines for us uh, the bare greens functions or the greens functions that we should use in, in our one over n expansion. Okay, so there's some quadratic form that emerges. I've called here d hat inverse, where the elements of d hat just give uh, the, the correlation functions between the fluctuations. So, and one, two, three, four here are shorthand for space time coordinates x1, x2, x3, and four. So it has components, for instance, delta C, delta C, delta C, delta G, and, and, and so on. Um, and here we'll introduce to kind of facilitate the large n one over n perturbation theory, we'll introduce this kind of diagrammatic notation where now because of this bilocal structure of the fields, the bare propagators are not just lines, but rather these 2D objects. So these indices indicate space-time coordinates one, two, three, and four. Uh, and I, I hope it's kind of visible, but the, the wavy lines denote um, Xi uh, Green's functions or Xi type, you know, kind of self-energy type, whereas the solid lines denote Green's function type propagate. Okay, um, so this defines for us the, the, the propagators that we'll use in our diagrammatics of the one over n expansion. Okay, so that's the, that's, that's the propagators. Now we need the interaction vertices. And so there's a few different types, but let me just look at two specifically. So if you remember a couple slides ago, there was an interaction term that looked like this. Uh, and so if I take now this C, uh, sigma, excuse me, and expand it around its saddle point value, I get this infinite sequence of terms where I've also kind of rescaled my fields in order to put the large N, the capital N uh, into the interaction vertices. And so just as an example, at order n equals three, the cubic interaction vertex, we can represent it diagrammatically this way, where wavy lines are places where you can attach a self-energy like Green's function. And these solid lines are just different uh, uh, saddle point Green's functions uh, that they are connected by these self-energies. Um, okay, so that's one type of diagram that results. Uh, another type was this cubic interaction term. So here, if you expand, then uh, the, the, the only interaction you, term you get is this cubic interaction between the bilocal Green's functions, G, G, and D. Uh, and here, this kind of has an interesting structure to it. Uh, it's a so-called seam vertex, where there's two places where you can ex uh, attach an external um, G, okay, denoted by these arrows. And then here, you can attach an external D propagator. Okay. And so diagrammatics of this sort, at least as far as I know, were first introduced by Kitayev and Se in this article in, in, back in 2018 in, in analysis of fluctuations um, uh, in, in kind of regular or more standard SYK models. Uh, and maybe one, oh, one thing I should probably mention is that you know, for SYK uh, experts, there's this issue of a, a zero mode that comes into this quadratic kernel in more standard kind of SYK models that comes from the time reparameterization symmetry. Uh, and this kind of complicates the story a bit. So this you know, zero mode is kind of dominates the fluctuations. So here actually we don't have this subtlety. So this is just a more standard, uh, you know, diagrammatic uh, perturbation theory in one over N, albeit with these kind of funny bilocal Green's functions. But other than that kind of formally, it's all standard. Okay. So let me just give you now a, a sample of a result that you get uh, at order one over N. So for instance, here is the first one over N correction to the self energy. Um, and these have the structure of kind of tadpole diagrams, like three dimensional tadpole diagrams. Uh, and that's just because you have a cubic interaction vertex. You, you expect something tadpole like. Um, and here are the two interaction vertices of these two types that I described before. There's a sheet vertex, which was this first one that I drew, and this seam vertex. And now you can, you know, of course, you can write down the integrals that uh, describe these, these diagrams. They're kind of messy, so I didn't bother to write them. But, you know, nevertheless, you know, with enough uh, fortitude, you could, in principle, compute the integrals. Um, but kind of one non-trivial result of this analysis that I want to highlight 
um, is, among other things, this yields an anomalous dimension for the fermions at order one over n. Uh, and in particular, this you know is is the first term in a sequence of one over you know, of one over n corrections to this fermion anomalous dimension, so that one could in principle compute it systematically. And that's, I think, as far as I know, at least, this is the first place where where um, uh, where, so we, we've written down, I think, for the first time, a kind of systematic expansion for this anomalous dimension. So it's come up in other places, but one has to go to high loop order, and it's kind of not computed in a systematic fashion. But this yields uh, you know, at least a starting point for a systematic calculation of this anomalous critical exponent, of this anomalous dimension, excuse me. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the kind of structure of the diagrammatic perturbation theory that one would get in the one over n expansion. Are there any questions? Uh, does Z receive a correction, the dynamic critical exponent? Um, it's a good question. I don't know if it does at order one over n. And in other calculations, I think it does at high loop order. But I, in our, maybe I think Avishkar and how you are here. No, you in guys the know? previous calculations, it, it uh, z is not corrected, even not when corrected. you get a anomalous dimension. I see. I see. And do we know? Do our well, our one over n corrections change z? I don't. I. I. I don't know. Like we have to do the calculation okay. explicitly, okay. but probably okay. not. <laughs> Yeah, I guess okay. but the integrals are pretty ugly. That's a good question. Um, okay, cool. So, all right, so if there are no questions then actually I'll turn now to also one, the last topic I wanted to discuss. I see I'm pretty, uh, pretty good on time. <laughs> so if there are questions, please. All right, good. So the last thing I wanted to talk about uh, are the instabilities of this non-Fermi liquid. Uh, at n equals infinity. So, you know, in, in the one over n expansion, there will also be um, potential instabilities that order one over n. So here, I just want to focus on those instabilities uh, of the model that exists exactly at, at n equal infinity. N equals infinity. So the first uh, possible instability is towards that I want to discuss is towards superconductivity. And here, I think the most interesting question, at least to my mind, is you know, what is the nature of the superconducting state that emerges from this non-Fermi liquid? So in kind of conventional theories of superconductivity, we're used to thinking about pairing of, of Cooper, you know, formation of Cooper pairs from coherent quasi-particles, kind of sharp, well-defined quasi-particles. But here, if you're deep in this non-Fermi liquid where everything is incoherent, how do we think about the nature of the, the, the pairs or the pairing state that results? Um, so that's one thing I think that would be interesting to address. Um, but now it turns out that if you take these GIJK to be general complex, that is, they have equal weight in their real and imaginary parts, there's no superconducting instability at all. Uh, and kind of, I think the intuition for that is just that for each realization of these GIJKs, you break time reversal symmetry, and time and uh, and that has kind of a well-known pair-breaking effect. Um, but if you instead take the case that the couplings GIJK are pure real which you can think of as just being the case of purely attractive interactions, then actually the story changes a little bit. So in fact, even at the kind of saddle point level, it turns out that new fields enter. If you take the case of, of strictly real couplings, so you actually obtain saddle point equations for a so-called anomalous Green's function, F, which is like a psi-psi correlation function. And similarly for the corresponding anomalous self-energy. And so here I've just written down the saddle point equation for the anomalous self-energy phi, uh, near to TC, where this phi is assumed small, and so you can linearize it. Um, and actually, it turns out that this equation that you get is nothing but the usual BCS gap equation, the linearized BCS gap equation, essentially, albeit with a different, you know, not with the BCS interaction, but with whatever interaction is mediated by this by this boson characterized by this Green's function D. Um, okay, and so now if you kind of look at uh, how things scale in this equation, actually, what you find is that uh, what you expect is that the scale for superconductivity for T, uh, the TC uh, actually is on the same order as the non-Fermi liquid scale. This I should have written it down. Sorry, this is G to the G to the fourth. Um, and so what that means is that there's no kind of separation of scales between the onset of non-Fermi liquid scaling and superconductivity. Uh, so maybe there's you know factors of two pi or something that can separate them, but there's no parametric separation of scales. Uh, and this I think is, is is rather generic. This has come up in other uh, studies of, of pairing in, in quantum critical near quantum critical points. 
Um, so, okay, this is, this is a feature of this problem, but is there anything else we can say about it? Uh, and so one thing one can try to do to separate TC and the non-Fermi liquid scale is generalize the model. So here, what you can do is introduce two different types of bosons, one attractive, and we could have M1 flavors of attractive bosons and M2 flavors of attractive, uh, excuse me, repulsive bosons, such that their total is still equal to N. Um, and then we can define a parameter, this curly K, which is their difference normalized by the total number of flavors. Uh, actually, so uh, at least, um, yeah, so there's th this reference, uh, Yahue and, and Subir actually studied a model of these sorts of repulsive interactions um, in this physical review research paper from 2020. Um, and so, okay, so what do we see here? So when uh, this curly K is, is one, meaning when the number of repulsive bosons is equal to zero, uh, we have a superconducting ground state. That's what I described on the last slide, as well as the case when M1 is equal to M2, um, in which case superconductivity is, is absent. And that was also the case of kind of general, that was similar to this case of general complex coupling. Okay, so the idea then is that tuning uh, K away from one suppresses superconductivity. Okay, so, so now uh, how, do we, how do we study this? So the, you know, so the question is, what is the TC now? Uh, how, and, and can we learn anything about the paired state that emerges if we can suppress, you know, if we can separate the non-Fermi liquid scale from this superconducting uh, transition temperature? Uh, but it turns out the full gap equation is, is hard to solve. Uh, I think we can, we can do it, but okay, haven't done it yet. Uh, but what you could do just as a first pass is you can just take the low energy forms of G and D that we found, you know, involving the Landau damping and this omega to the two thirds scaling and evaluate at T equals zero. And so here, what you obtain is the following thing. So this is nothing but this gap equation that I wrote uh, on, on the previous slide, or maybe if you're more familiar, this is like the beta salpeter, salpeter equation for the pairing vertex pi. Uh, and what, what happens kind of interestingly is that this equation is fully universal, meaning all the coupling constants completely drop out. So G, the Yukawa coupling is completely gone. The only thing that enters is this, this uh, parameter K. Um, and in fact, uh, things like this have actually been studied, uh, or you know, integral equations like this have been studied in you know, the same context, but for slightly different models by Andrei Chubakov and collaborators, they call these so-called gamma models where they allow these exponents to also vary. But anyway, uh, the, the point here is that because this is a completely kind of scale invariant or, or universal equation, there's nothing here to set the superconducting transition temperature. So, okay, so you might say that that's kind of not, ends up being not, not, not super useful, um, but okay, but I'll show you that in fact, we can still learn something from this integral equation. Uh, so what, what do we do about it? So here we'll follow earlier work uh, that at least in the context of SYK models was first uh, kind of pioneered by um, Klebanov and collaborators in, in 2019. And what they did was the following. So you take this pairing vertex and you assume this uh, power law form with exponent alpha, but you allow alpha to be in general complex. That is, have it has a non-zero imaginary part. And what they conjectured, at least as far as I understand, it was a conjecture in, in that paper was that if alpha has a non-zero imaginary part, and that indicates uh, an instability, um, in this case, towards superconductivity. Uh, but it could be towards other forms of order if you take a different kind of vertex. Uh, okay, and actually I just found yesterday <laughs> this pretty neat paper by Benedetti that just appeared last month in which he, he shows uh, using kind of CFT techniques um, that you know, he, he kind of shows pretty convincingly how having an imaginary uh, um, uh, exponent really does indicate an instability of the system by just computing uh, the kind of, by, by just showing that, uh, that the negative exponent implies a negative, um, uh, quadratic fluctuation in the effective action. Uh, okay, nevertheless, so, but the procedure then is that uh, we'll use uh, the, so yeah, the idea is to, to argue that anytime you have a non-zero exponent in the solution to this equation, a non-zero imaginary part of the exponent, the system is unstable, okay? And so, so we plug this scaling form into the previous integral equation, solve for alpha, and you obtain the following thing. So K, this curly K again is our difference between the number of attractive and repulsive bosons. When K is zero, you have no superconducting instability. When K is one, 
uh, you have a superconducting ground state. And what you find, if I just focus here on the orange curve, is that this imaginary part of alpha vanishes at some finite value, so k star roughly this. And this, and so the inference then is that this indicates the end of the superconducting ground state. Okay, so for k bigger than this value, you have a superconducting ground state. For k less than this value, you do not. Okay. So, so that's so. So then the idea is to potentially tune close to this k star, maybe, and, and try to separate out uh, the non Fermi liquid uh, scale and the superconducting transition temperature and see if you can you know, find something interesting that emerges uh, as the system condenses into a superconductor. Okay. So let me just mention then briefly uh, one other instability we looked at, which is this instability towards charge density wave or CDW formation uh, at wave vector 2kf. Uh, here, the idea, the kind of procedure is similar. It turns out in this case, repulsive interactions favor CDW order. That is curly k less than zero, where you have more repulsive bosons than attractive bosons. And if you perform a similar sort of instability analysis, um, that is, you know, you put in, you get this kind of scaling equation and you look for complex scaling dimensions, you obtain the following thing. Uh, so here again, let's just focus on the imaginary part of the exponent alpha plotted as a function of K. And here again, you find a finite value where um, the imaginary part vanishes, indicating um, a, uh, a place where you know, this, the ground state of the, of the system is no longer a charge density wave, but something else. Um, and in principle, one could look at other instabilities as well. So for instance, if you were to add spin into the problem, you could look at spin density wave instabilities and things like this. Okay, so I see I'm, I went pretty fast. I hope, <laughs> I hope, it was, I hope that didn't mean I went too fast and it was still clear, but let me now just, just draw some conclusions. So uh, today I told you about uh, the ways in which the interaction with the soft order with soft order parameter fluctuations near a QCP can destabilize a Fermi liquid. Uh, I showed you a model uh, with random couplings and large n that yields a controlled theory of the resulting non-Fermi liquid state uh, and described or sketched for you how one could hope to systematically compute the one over n corrections um, by varying the number of attractive and repulsive bosons, I showed you how you can change the nature of the ground state, for instance, getting superconductors, CDWs, potentially other things. Uh, and one thing that I didn't mention, uh, but that's in our, our paper, is that if you now also take these, these uh, couplings, GIJK, to be random functions of space, R, then this gives a controlled large end theory of a so-called marginal Fermi liquid. And marginal Fermi liquids are, are is a, class of models that's kind of important in describing the phenomenology of various correlated materials, for instance, to get linear and T resistivity and stuff like that. Okay, so with that, uh, let me uh, stop and, and thank you very much for your attention. Great, uh, let's all thank Ilya for a wonderful talk. You, you took exactly an hour, by the way. So it's a perfect oh, time. is that right? Oh, yes, wow. Yeah, oh, I th oh my God, yeah, I'm totally, I, I was looking at my clock and I thought I started at three. <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, your time at two, and I was totally confused how I could possibly have gone so fast. <laughs> uh, maybe we can oh, we can take uh, one, one question before um, moving on to the discussion. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you. So, are these systems self-averaging? So, do you know if, for example, at least a leading order in n, the the free energy is the same as well? You could just basically average the partition function directly. Yes, I think the answer is yes. Maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. Yes. Yeah, I think that's true. Okay, so I can ask my There are actually, uh, for the zero dimensional version of this problem, you only have this random Yukawa coupling between uh, electrons and bosons. Uh, there, were, uh, there were people who did QMC on, on this and, and they found it to be self-averaging. Oh, cool. Perfect. Yeah, that's yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, that's right. So there are calculations at finite n. Uh, actually, at some point, I had also just messed around to try and do these calculations. And indeed, you find that for n not so big, you get qualitatively similar results to the you know large n. That, that's in the zero plus one dimensional case, where the analytics, you know, you could, or numerics is still, you, know, you can hope to do something. Awesome, thanks. <laughs>